Welcome everyone to the session today and thank you for joining. Um, just to give you a short overview of the session. And so first off, um, I'm Kelly Stathis. I'm Data Sites Technical Community Manager um, and I'm joining you today from Vancouver in Canada. Um, and in this session um, that I'm facilitating today, um, we'll hear about how data site DOIs can support discovery and reuse. And so first we'll have Data Sites Product Director Maria Gould, um, who will help put us help us put meta, data site metadata in context. So provide a foundation for how metadata and insights um, are used in the research landscape. And then next we'll hear from some of the key players who are leveraging data site metadata um, for developing innovative tools for locating research. And so we'll have Paolo Mangi from OpenAir, Casey Meyer um, from, oh, sorry, Patricia Tortosa from Clarivate, and then Casey Meyer from our research, which um, develops Open Alex. Then we'll have ample time for Q&A um, and a quick break. Be actually, there's a, a longer break between this one and the next few sessions. So we'll have some time before the next sessions of this meeting today. As so this will be an opportunity to learn about how data set metadata is and, and can be reused to enable discovery um, and the impact that rich metadata can have on the scholarly record. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Maria to start us off. I will switch your sharing, Maria. Great. Thank you, Kelly. And hello to our esteemed panel and welcome and welcome to all of you joining today from wherever in the world you happen to be. It's great to see you all here. So. I have the, the honor and privilege of being the bridge between Kelly's intro and our esteemed panelists. And I have two main jobs to do in, in this little bridge. I uh, am going to get a sense of who's joining the session today and, and what is your perspective on and relationship to data site metadata and, and discovery and harvesting. Uh, and then second, I'm going to provide you for with a little bit of context for why we're convening this session today and why this is such an important and timely topic for data site and the broader community. So moving on to my first job, I am going to invite all of you to participate in a very brief Menti poll. If you've never used Menti before, all you need to do is either go to menti.com and enter the code that you see on the screen. We'll also put the link in chat so you can get it there. Or if you want to do the poll on the mobile device, you can also just scan the QR code that you see as well. So I'll give everyone a moment to get set up there and then bear with me while I switch screens over to the mentee questions so I can share what people's responses are looking like. So can we get the link in chat if we don't have it there already? And I'm going to move over to the first question now. All right, so three questions, as I mentioned, and the first one is kind of general sense of who's here today, what are you currently doing with the data site metadata, and you can choose any response that applies to you here. So we're looking at who's registering metadata with data site, who's integrating data site metadata into some sort of system or tool, who's analyzing data site metadata for research or reporting purposes, or perhaps some other purpose, uh, who here is contributing suggestions to the data site metadata schema, and maybe you don't do any of those things, but you're a general metadata enthusiast or Maybe you do all of those things uh, with data site metadata and you're a general metadata enthusiast, and that's great as, as well. We're happy to have you all here. I'll leave this up for 
another few brief moments to give everyone a chance to weigh in. Seeing that there are a lot of you here who are registering metadata and quite a lot as well who are building integrations and also analyzing. A lot of you contributing suggestions to the schema, which is great. All right, last call to enter your response here before we move on, but it's great to get a sense of who's here today, specifically in terms of what you are currently doing with data site metadata. So we're gonna move on to the next question now. And this question is uh, more specific to the topic of, of today's session, which is, uh, are you or your organization currently harvesting data site metadata for any purpose? So looking at uh, who's actively engaged with uh, pulling or ingesting or harvesting uh, large, batches or, or sets of data site metadata to populate in, in some other system or tool on an ongoing basis, perhaps. So we'll give everyone a few moments to participate here on this one, and then we'll see what we have. I'm seeing that we have a number of active harvesters self-reporting here, and that's great to see. We have some no responses. That's totally okay. We know from the previous slide that a lot of you here are doing many types of things with data site metadata. Harvesting is really just one of many types of activities, and then a few of you who are not sure. So I guess that's a good opportunity to mention if you have questions about this, feel free to get in touch. All right, last call to respond to this question. Thank you all very much for participating. And then we have one more question as well. All right, so uh, this is uh, specific to those of you who answered yes on the previous slide. So uh, this is really looking at if you are currently harvesting, what methods are you using? Data site has a few different uh, methods right now for harvesting metadata, and we can point you to some, uh, to some resources in the chat to learn more, uh, and we can get into those. Uh, questions in the course of the session as well, but this is just kind of a, a general intake to see uh, what people are currently doing when they harvest metadata. And if you answered no or not sure on the previous question, you don't have to respond to this one, but it might be interesting for you to uh, see what the responses are looking like and learn a little bit about the different methods that we have uh, for harvesting available. So I'm seeing we have a lot of usage of the REST API, followed by OAIPMH, followed by the data file, and some of you who aren't sure. So again, uh, that's my opportunity to say if you wanna ask us questions about this or need some clarity, we are here to help and support and explain.
seeing Jez in the chat saying that downloaded the data file for the first time this week. Congratulations. Looking forward to hearing about your experience and digging into it. All right, last call to respond to this slide. And this will be the last, the last poll of the day, I think. Okay, thank you all very much for participating. I think this will stay up after I stop the screen share here. So if there's anything else you wanna add, if you didn't already get a chance to, you're welcome to, but I'm going to move back to the slide deck in a moment. All right. All right, so now coming back to the topic of the day and why are we talking about metadata harvesting and why am I sharing this image of a waterfall? This is Multnomah Falls outside my home city of Portland, Oregon, in case anyone is wondering or in case anyone here in the session is also in the Pacific Northwest, this might be a familiar sight to see. So why are we talking about this? We spend a lot of time at data site and across the data site community talking about registering DOIs, one of the core services that people use data site for. And registering DOIs is really, it's, it's one really important part of, of what it means to, to interact with, with data site services, but it's really the beginning of a long journey. Think of it as like the top of the waterfall, if you will. And so we really wanted to focus this session today on highlighting what happens downstream as the water continues to flow. So specifically looking at what are the ways in which all of that metadata that comes into data site as a result of, of DOI registration uh, can be discovered and harvested and integrated into various systems for different purposes. So we've seen an enormous growth uh, over the years in data sites metadata store. I think currently we're at about 60 million DOIs that have been uh, registered and, and are findable. And this is a extremely rich and vast treasure trove of information and insights about research outputs and activities and how they're connected. And so we have right now systems of all types and uh, systems of all types and systems of all sizes that are actively retrieving data site metadata to reuse or, or populate in another system. So our panelists today are going to showcase three uh, really important use cases of, of large scale uh, harvesting for aggregated discovery systems that are built in, in large part on data site metadata. But this is, uh, this is one important, uh, really important use case, but also just one part of a bigger picture or one stream emerging from this waterfall. So if we zoom out and we think about the broader ecosystem in which data site metadata exists, uh, just like a waterfall might flow into a river, which flows into other rivers, which then end up in the ocean. We can um, think about the metadata coming into data site in, in a similar way. And what we're really trying to do um, as an organization and as a community is look at all of the different uh, access points that we have uh, upstream, downstream, midstream to support a really rich metadata ecosystem. And so that means bringing in uh, metadata from across the community for all types of research outputs. And then within the context of all of the services uh, that, uh, that we build and that we offer to support uh, really valuable context and robust connections for that metadata that is coming in. And then making sure that all of this metadata can be easily discoverable and harvestable for the world to enable 
uh, discovery and insights and to help propel knowledge forward. So this means that when we're talking about metadata and talking about harvesting um, at data site, we're sort of operating on several different levels. And so uh, one of those levels or one of those tributaries to the river is you know, looking at how we can incorporate and represent all types of research outputs and activities and continuing to grow the, the spectrum and, and scope of, of what can come in and how we can support rich metadata for describing those entities and connecting them to each other. And we also need really robust infrastructure to support all of those upstream parts, as well as the downstream parts of the process to make sure that all of that metadata uh, can easily be discovered and reused and harvested and integrated in all of the places where it can be and might be. And lastly, we need and we want to engage with all of our membership and all of the user communities that are out there to understand their needs and pain points, not just with the upstream part of the process, not just with the top of the waterfall, but also with how it is being discovered and reused and populated into different places around the world. So that is my uh, invitation to, to all of you uh, to say, please um, join us um, in this conversation. If you click the uh, scan the QR code that is shown on the screen and I'll put a link in the chat as well. We're actively uh, engaging and consulting right now with those who are harvesting data site metadata to understand those needs and use cases and to help inform some of the product development work that we're doing right now on harvesting related services. This is an ongoing journey. It's an ongoing uh, conversation. It's an ever flowing river. And so if this is something that you want to be part of, if you are not already, if we're not already talking with you, uh, we want to hear from you. So uh, there's a short form that we set up to uh, get in touch with us so that we can have some conversations about what you are currently doing or what you are wanting to do uh, in terms of harvesting metadata. Um, so that as we continue to develop infrastructure and develop uh, other tools and services around that to support harvesting that we are taking all of these needs and use cases into account. So uh, we look forward or I look forward to being in touch with all of you about that and just want to thank you all again for being part of the session today and thank the panel for offering their thoughts as well and with that I will pass the mic back to Kelly. Thank you so much Maria. Um... Yeah, so let me just share these slides again, and then we'll move to the next portion here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we will have that link in the, in the chat for the, the form that Maria just um, shared the QR code for. So really looking forward to everyone's responses on that. Um, and so, yeah, with, with that context in mind now, um, we're going to move to this portion where we have three um, wonderful guest panelists here um, to speak to their different discovery systems. And so in preparing um, for this session, we asked the panelists to try to address these three questions. First, how does your service work with metadata to advance research discoverability? Then how is data site DOI metadata incorporated into your service? And then what can data site users who are registering DOIs do to um, improve the discoverability of those DOIs in your service by enhancing their metadata. And so first off, we have Paula Mangi from Open Air, and I yeah. will I hand over remote control to you to present. So I guess if I click now, hello. So I'm Paula Mangi. Uh, I'm the CTO of Open Air and in charge of the operation of the uh, Open Air Graph, which I'll present today. Thank you, first of all, DataSide for uh, hosting us, uh, all of us here. Uh, I know some of you already, but uh, it's always great to have these places where we can discuss together. Um, now, I clicked, but nothing happened. Okay, it did. Open Air Graph, the basics. Let me first introduce uh, what it is. Uh, it's what they call an SKG, so a scholarly knowledge graph. So it's basically a collection of metadata representing different entities in the uh, scholarly communication domain. Um, we are collecting this from several sources. 
some of these are repositories, publishers that you will see, but also data side cross rep and main uh, registries uh, out there. Uh, the data that we are producing is supposed to be reused at CC0 uh, to build further services for discovery monitoring. Um, the kind of data that we are collecting, I clicked, uh, but again, it's not moving. Uh, okay. Uh, is uh, visualized by this data model. It's very high level, so it's view from the moon, but it's just to uh, let you, uh, to, to grasp the, the, the idea behind it. So we have the research products uh, in the middle, which can be split into publications, data, software, and other research products, which we could not basically classify based on the previous three, together with relationships between them, citation, relationship, version, supplemental, et cetera. Then we, of course, link to people, authors in this case, uh, uh, with uh, uh, a profile and, of course, the orchid behind, we link to organizations for affiliations. And uh, we have an administrative side of things. Basically, we are serif-like in the sense that we match the funders, the streams, and the projects. And we have the granularity of the projects behind them. Uh, of course, we keep track of provenance of everything that we collect and everything, as you will see, that we also produce. So for each object, you know, where each bit of the object, starting from the attributes, comes from. Uh, and of course, to the products, we attach indicators, which may be derived from the data itself or uh, collected from sources that make these available. And I click again, probably, should I click twice? No, that was too much. Apologies, but I'm going back. Can you go back? Because I think it's going forward. Uh, I can go back for you. Yeah, let me just move it yeah, back. Thank you. Um, this one? Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So main features, it, it embeds indicators, as I mentioned, which we collect from sources like the APCs or uh, downloads and views uh, that we calculate from and we collect from make data count uh, standard systems, polarity citations, which we calculate internally. We have Kochi and many other uh, uh, indexes uh, inside. We are, include all persistent identifiers because, again, we are very open science oriented. So we are really not to focus only on publications, but all sorts of, uh, let's say, uh, product out there. So we include all persistent identifiers uh, and we support stable identifiers on top of those. So when we basically the duplicate information, we make sure that the resulting record has one identifier that's stable over time. And again, it's not going forward. I'm sorry, Eddie, uh, if you, Kelly, can go one slide forward. Okay. Uh, so roughly, this is the chain uh, of data provision. So we have many data sources that are providing us with metadata. We have uh, designed open air guidelines, which are um, basically metadata standards that are being implemented by several platforms today to collect metadata. So uh, thousands of sources are already compatible with the guidelines and we collect from them metadata. But in some cases, this is not the case. Uh, so we have these so-called custom data sources. One of them is data sites from which we collect by OEIPMH, uh, the APIs they have. And we recently experimented with uh, the dump uh, to uh, ensure uh, at least the bootstrap and the, and the refresh from time to time of the metadata. Uh, we aggregate the data, we enrich it with mining AI tools. For example, we infer links between publications and data and so on. Uh, publications and software in data site, but in the whole system, we deduplicate them and we merge uh, records that are represented the same entities. We enrich them with uh, further inference, exploiting relationships in the graph, and we finalize the data. Uh, everything is mm, described quite cleanly, I think, in the documentation. So if you want to know how we take the data site data and include it into the graph, uh, it's described how we map it, because this is not an obvious process. Uh, and I'm Kelly, sorry, I'm trying to, okay. Okay, this is what we infer in terms of relationships. And what I reported below is the result of the exercise of, of inferring uh, from publication full text, which we are downloading links to DOIs uh, in a data site. We do this, of course, for all sorts of persistent identifiers, but this example refers to the numbers that we find beyond the one that we collect from data site itself. So you see this, it's a lot, it's like almost 200 millions uh, links that we are finding from other objects to data sites, which we can, of course, uh, make available to the world. You can please go ahead. Uh, 
data sources are many. Uh, so we're, there are more than 140,000. Directly, it's around 2,000. So we collect from aggregators like data sites itself. And we are collecting also from many other registries, as you can see. So data site is one of the most important ones. Uh, and we are, of course, going through it. Uh, in some cases, we go straight to the original data source, where sometimes uh, if uh, the process of the data collection is efficient enough, metadata is richer than the one that we can collect. But in most of the cases, we go through data site here. And uh, uh, as you can see, there's a plethora of different kinds of sources we are relying to, uh, on, including uh, Unpaywall that is now is still there. However, we collect it, open citations, Microsoft, uh, um, Academics, Raften, uh, is still there as a collection and many others, including publishers, repositories, preprints, and so on. If you can please go on. Consumers, we have many. Some of them are not visible. I don't know why. Some of the features, maybe it's uh, an animation. Anyway, so uh, we include organizations. So we are offering discovery services for organizations like, uh, well, the Irish, uh, for example, recent Irish Monitor, the Netherlands. They have built uh, a discovery service on top of the graph. And uh, we have many service providers, including Scopus. We have exchange with the publishers like Springer, Severe, they give us PDFs, we return metadata that we infer. Many funders, like more than 30 today. And of course, researchers, which are publishing results based on the data that we provide. Uh, can you go on? Yeah, that was a wrong animation. So these are the numbers. Uh, of course, this is post the duplication. We are collecting 400 million graph data objects. And after the duplication, these are the results. Uh, the, all these objects may have one or more uh, persistent identifiers when they are merged and they bring uh, relations between each other. As you can see we have 61 million resource data, uh, but data site is not only about data as you will see in the, in the next slides. Um, if you can go on. Uh, as you can see, we collect many uh, relationships from different sources, publication to publications, you know, the usual collection, but also publication data links, which are now 138 million, plus publication software links, and so on. Uh, and uh, we are exploiting this again for discovery reasons, so you can move from one object to another, but also for monitoring, especially in open science uh, trends, measuring open science trends and metrics. So these are actually key elements in the scholarly ecosystem today. So finding the links between these objects is a challenge, it's an interesting one, uh, but also very effective in terms of what we can uh, produce and generate as open data. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So this is the result of uh, collecting data site in OpenAir today. As you can see, the content of data site can be split in publications, data, software, uh, other research products. This is uh, the result of our, let's say, uh, uh, mapping and reschedule of, uh, of the content. Um, so if you can go on, just want to, okay, you can see here the related data sources. So the resources that we, the data sources that we found are overlapping with um, data sites in the sense that they have uh, duplicate records. So they're merged be between each other. So that's another uh, interesting thing to see. And as you can see, some of them are not uh, effectively uh, served directly uh, by uh, data sites is basically the same, the copy of the same object, but published in a different place. This is often the case for publications more than, uh, than for data sets, which are generally published once or twice in the average. But for publications, this is often the case. And if you go on, I uh, will show you one interesting scenario. So this is one example of a publication in archive uh, that has been assigned a DOI in data site. And this is the record that you can collect from data site. Um, the creators uh, uh, do not have an ORCID ID in this very moment. So the record is uh, exactly as it was provided by the archives. So if you can go to the next slide, this is the same record, but in open air. And as you can see, uh, it's richer. It has all the ORCID identifiers and so on. Uh, several definitions of green and gold that come from other sources. Uh, it has uh, funders and the projects that are funding the project. And it also has a related object with it. But if you, uh, if you go on, you can see uh, that it has 22 versions, right? So fields of science funded by, and then you have the versions. Uh, okay, 
So these are, um, this is a, basically a visualization of the menu for the versions. And as you can see between uh, the, the 22 versions among them, you have two different versions coming from two members of data site. So it is interesting because one is a repository and one is archive itself. So basically the authors deposited it twice through data site with two different DRs. And now these are merged uh, together. Of course, you have the citations and all the indicators that come with it. The same happens with the data sets. So uh, as a result of collecting from data site, for example, two versions of the same data set, uh, they, belong, they come from Mendeley. Uh, the result that we get is that we can connect these two uh, in, the, in, in open air. So in one object that, of course, keeps track of the original. I'm clicking, but it's not going ahead of the original link. So as you can see, we have the both DOIs, but one record only. But we also found another 11 versions coming from different sites. Uh, so we aggregate the citations, of course, of, of those because we duplicate also the relationships. And we also found a link to a project that wasn't there in the original record, neither in Mendeley, neither, of course, uh, in data site. So this is to say that thanks to uh, the uh, metadata that we're collecting from data site, we're able to reconnect uh, different information via a persistent identifier. Okay. So this is the data set example. And as you can see, we also preserve the link to the publication that was in fact, in this case, coming from data site itself. So data site actually plays an important role in, the, in this scenario because it offers the DOI that are linking often in many cases, objects that do not have uh, a persistent identifiers and they bring them, uh, them behind a persistent identifier. And in this case, we can learn from these objects, right? So do not have a DOI, but they may have richer information and come from uh, trusted sources. In many cases, they actually have the PDF, which is crucial for the mining and for the enrichment. Uh, so we've been working a lot uh, these days with data site and I hope we'll keep uh, working on this, especially in exchanging data because I know that it's now in their interest to enrich the records. And these are just examples on uh, how this can be done and how we can benefit from uh, this collaboration. Access to the graph, um, you can access it in many ways. So through data sets in Zenodo, through APIs, uh, and the documentation I think is quite clear on how it is going to be, or how it can be accessed. And we are now releasing uh, a new API is under testing now with several users worldwide, and we'll hopefully release it uh, soon uh, in November. I think this, if I well remember, was the last slide. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paolo. And apologies for the hiccups with the remote control there. Um, yeah, thank you for that I'm really sorry. great overview of uh, details. It's probably, it's probably me. No, no. I also turned it off halfway through so we wouldn't have the double advancing. Um, so thank you so much for that overview. Um, and I just also wanted to mention for everyone in the in the room here that um, you can use the Q&A to ask questions either of a specific panelist or of all the panelists. And we'll have ample time for Q&A after the next couple of presentations. Thank you, Paulo. Um, I will pass it over to Patricia from Clarivate then. And let me just hand over remote control to you. But if you'd prefer for me to advance, just let me know during it. Okay, let me see if I can, if it works for me. No, I don't think it's working for me either. Sorry, Kelly, I could try and. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Patricia Tortosa. I'm the Senior Progs Operation Manager for Clarivate. Uh, you might know us better as the Web of Science. And I specifically work for the Data Citation Index, which is a sub uh, product from the Web of Science family. Um, if you can move forward, please, Kelly. Thank you. Um, in the Data Citation Index, we, um, we, as the name implies, we index metadata from a wide variety of repositories. Uh, most of them actually do come from data side just because they do such a wonderful job of providing an infrastructure for them to deposit their data and mint the DOIs, which as Paolo explained as well, is just crucial for us to um, link the data sets with the papers or other um, related records. 95% of the data that we have in DCI is open data. 
um, that might require a free login or some sort of like registration just because of the sensitive nature of the data. However, most of it is free for the users to access. Uh, we also support for data sharing and follow the 411 um, principles and declarations. So we try to make sure that the data is as comprehensive and follow the FAIR principles, um, which again, data side plays a big role in this um, because they also form part, uh, take part of these initiatives. We can make sure that the data that then we're indexing is in line with our beliefs. So if you can please move to the next one. Um, so in order to be part of the data citation index, we actually do evaluate um, repository by repository to make sure that the content of these resources is in line with our, our values and principles. Um, one of these most important um, Sorry, um, the most important factor that we look for this is the persistence of these data sets. So by that, what we mean is that it has to have a unique persistent identifier or a DOI. Um, this is again where data side comes into play, facilitating the possibility, to, the possibility to the researchers and organizations to mint their DOIs, which is again a unique identifier for each specific data set, making it unique and findable. Um, again, with this, we can, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, with this, uh, we can make sure that we can link the different relationships between the data sets and other types of resources, not only data sets. However, being the data citation index, that's what we I'll be talking about. Next one, please. Okay, so the types of data that we currently have in the data citation index is arts and humanities, social sciences and science and technology. You can see the subcategories within each one of them. Um, I believe that data side is actually doing an incredible, an incredible job here because not all the repositories have the resources and the platforms to make the data available, especially arts and humanities. I'm an arts and humanities person myself, and I believe data side is making a huge like effort in, in helping this sort of uh, repositories and um, research to take part in the data sharing, which, you know, um, some, some fields have been taken um, they've been on this for a lot longer, so they have their own initiatives and, and they've been on the game for a lot longer, but not other fields such as ha um, art and humanities. And yeah, um, a DOI, again, minting a DOI is probably the most important part um, in getting this done. So if you can please move into the next one. Um, what we need in the data citation index um, in order to make the data discoverable, in order to be findable by the users and to be cited, to be duplicated, to be uh, located. We need the unique ID um, in the repository, um, then a date provided, author, the repository information, a URL or a DOI or both, a title and the year published. Um, as you can see, all this information is basically the essentials to provide a citation um, in order to cite the data set uh, in the paper. So these are the basic fields that we require. And it also happen to be the, if I'm correct, the basic fields that data site is also requiring the users when they mint in their data set. So this is making a job a lot easier for us as well, just because what we need is already provided by us when we harvest in data site metadata. So you can move into the next one, please. Um, here I'm just providing, you can see the sort of like recommendations that us at the data citation index and Clarivate have um, in order to ensure that, you know, the data is stored the way you should, that is searchable and is findable. Um, this is the same principles that you can see for a whole lot of all the organizations. 
Um, so I don't think there is anything groundbreaking here on this slide. So you can move into the next one. Um, now we're going to show. I'm going to show you how the data that we get from data side, how it then gets displayed on the data citation index, and where all these other values that I mentioned before come into play to make sure that um, we display in the records properly, and they have suitable metadata and is comprehensive for the users to then be able to locate, decide, and repurpose. Um, you can move into the next one, please. Okay, so you can see in here, um, this this is the search engine that we have within the data citation index. You can search by title, you can search by date, you can search by author, you can say save by repository. Uh, but at the same time, we also allow a search by keyword and resource type. Again, this is only data. Uh, but we do include a search by functionality, but the different types of data is it an image, is it an audiovisual resource, is it a software, and also by um, subject or keywords. Um, all both of these things are very useful for us, and I believe for the users as well. And this is something that DataSide also provides in the metadata that we harvest. Not all the um, sources that we harvest include this information, however, DataSide does. And we find that is heavily beneficial for the users as well, because sometimes you just have like a round idea of what you are looking for. and. Just put in the keyword there, provides all the data sets from the wide variety of repositories um, that we cover that are linked to your specific query request. So you can move into the next one. Uh, this is a specific record. Um, this is, um, as you can see here, we have a lot more information than just the basics. So we have the title, we are linking to the DOI and the repository itself. Worth mentioning that in the data citation index, we don't store the data, we just index it. And then we refer to the repository itself for the user to access the data. So we're just interested in the actual metadata information, um, which again is what we get from data side. Um, you, we provide with the abstract, the keywords, and if you can move into the next slide, please, Kelly. Okay, then we also provide the links to any other bits in the literature that this data set has been mentioned or referenced. So, as same as, um, sorry, I, I, <laughs> um, we link the data sets that we have in the data citation index with the papers and journals that we have in the Web of Science core collection. One of the main uses for um, one of the main indicators to create these links are actually the unique identifiers in the DOIs. Um, so you can move into the next one, please. Um, again, you can see here another example of a data set. This one in particular comes from Figshare, and we do actually harvest Figshare through data side. So this will be an example of what we get when we harvest um, data side. I should mention, we are currently using the OAI PMJ endpoint to harvest. However, we are migrating towards an API. So that's why I didn't quite mention or provided any sort of um, slides about this harvesting in particular, just because like we're in the process of migrating, uh, we find that the API provides um, some layers of discoverability that the OAI is not quite. So that's why I'm only mentioning it now when there's no slides about this. Um, if you can move into the next one, please, Kelly. Um, again, this is, I don't know why it's the same page again. <laughs> um, you can move another one. Oh, is it the same slides again? Sorry. Can you click no, one more? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure why the same slide got twice, but um 
I, I would like to point that on the left, on the right hand side of the screen within the latest citation network um, latest section there, you said that it says seven citations. So this will be the citation link in that we've created uh, from the data citation index to the Web of Science core collection. That's where the, most of the articles and papers uh, would be indexed. Um, in order to do this, we obviously use the, uh, the DOI. We also um, use in the wild citation linking that we have and something that again data side are doing that not everybody is doing is when we have is the metadata they actually provide in some data sets the linking of the um, the data set just because when the users have been minting the DOI they've been kindly providing this information to us which again is highly beneficial and not everybody does, but I feel like data side is doing an incredible job at promoting this and making sure that the metadata is as comprehensive as it gets rather than just like a little name and a title in a date. Because at the end of the day, that doesn't make the data discoverable whatsoever. Um, so yeah, you can move into the next one, please. Um, so yeah, I guess we don't have any any time for questions as in right now. You can ask me questions at the end. So I guess this is, this slide is um not important at the minute. <laughs> and that's pretty much it from my part. Um, I just would like to um obviously acknowledge the great part the data side uh, take part in the data citation index. Um, I believe we have as eighty percent of the repositories that we currently cover in the data citation index through data sites. Um, they do a great job at um, promoting best practices, facilitating the minting on the DOI for the researchers to make their data available. So it's, you guys are doing a great job and I think this community call is such a great idea, especially targeting metadata, which not always is the main focus of attention for um this kind of like uh conferences so yeah and thank you kelly for putting all of this together great thank you so much patricia um thanks for the yeah the really great overview of the data citation index and also for the, the very kind words at the end um so if anyone does have questions for patricia you can put them in the q a and then we'll have time at the the end here for her to answer um, as well as questions for all of the panelists i believe and... another slide at the end with um a couple of links if you got, oh, yeah. if you don't mind, yeah. <laughs> so that one over there. <laughs> the first link is just in case anybody wants to know a little bit more about us, there's a, an essay that we put together that explains a little bit more about the principles and the core values that we have. And then at the end, if there's any repositories out there uh, that are attending this call and would like to take part in the data citation index, we do have a submission link uh, that you can email us and we'll have the review. And if you already mint your data sets through data side, again, that, you know, bumps up the chances of being part in this AI. <laughs> Great, yeah, thank you so now. much, Patricia. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, and with that, I will pass it over um, to Casey from our research representing um, Open Alex. Casey, do you want to try the remote control, or after that, yeah, do you want me to control? Okay, it worked I, earlier, I, so I gave it a it, shot. It did, and we tested it. Um, yeah. I'll hand it over to you, and just let me know if you have any trouble. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Casey Meyer. I'm with R Research, who is the nonprofit organization that created um, on Paywall and Open Alex. Um, we're, like I said, we're completely funded by um, grants and continuing uh, funds from some premium type accounts. But all of our data is open. All of our code is fully open and. Um, we recently integrated data site, which people, a lot of people are asking for into open Alex and it's an ongoing integration. So I want to talk about it today. All right. I clicked. I don't know if it's doing anything. Let's see. Oh, there. Did I do that or you do that? Okay. All right. So we'll just talk a little bit. About... It's all good. Okay. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about Open Alex. Um, it's a fully open academic data set uh, built from a lot of different sources. 
and kind of like Paolo talked about open air, uh, what the goal is to connect these different kinds of entities together into a graph. So you have art at works, what we call articles at works, which cross stuff calls them too at the center, but you can get the connections such as authors, uh, topics, institutions. You can get metrics about these. Um, we have a large data site, a data set of about 261 million uh, works right now. And it's all distributed freely through an API, which is we're kind of an API first organization right now. That's our main uh, product. Uh, our goal is to create a very easy to use well-documented API that has uh, let, uh, no friction. So that's what we're proud of. And you can access through the API. Um, it has high rate limits as well. So you can use it a lot and without running into any rate limits or anything like that. We have a website available as well. And then we have the monthly snapshot kind of like uh, um, Kelly and Paolo have talked about with a monthly download that's free as well, hosted through S3 on Amazon. So here's a little more ingest process. Uh, we like like others. We use Crossref. We use PubMed. We now use DataSite. We have about over three thousand institutional repositories registered with us. That's through Unpaywall, and Unpaywall is gradually getting merged into OpenAlex. And at some point, we may even serve Unpaywall completely from through OpenAlex. Um, but those repositories, we have other sources. Um, such as websites, PDFs that help get us the, this, the open access status that, go, that kind of is integrated into Unpaywall. DOAJ, that we have a partnership with the ISSN portal, Retraction Watch, which has been recently integrated into Crossref, and uh, different kinds of APC data. And some of our stuff is just manual curation from different, different places. And what that gets you, uh, we combine it, deduplicate it, enrich it with other data to get you things like metrics. Uh, we have a strong process that, de that disambiguates authors. So you can learn about different authors and then get your references, different versions, topics of machine learning involved that helps uh, do a lot of these processes. And yeah, the goal is to get you a clean, you know, organized data set of uh, different articles that are coming in and to be able to do different kinds of analysis. And it is being heavily used. Uh, the API receives about uh, 10 million requests per month and the uh, unpaywall receives about 20 million. And we have lots of people downloading the monthly data set and building different kinds of products on top of it. So commercial and um, free to use. I'll go to the next slide. So how we did the data site ingest, um, we're not done with it. I'll be up front. It's, it's about, I would say 60% finished and we had some other priorities come up, but we still have it on our roadmap to complete hopefully in the next three to four months. We used the public data file for the initial ingest. Um, we loaded that into a Postgres database, and then we went over, it pretty much looks like the API format, which is very convenient. So we uh, we used that initial public data file and went over some primary sources and ingested them. And then the goal is to, we ingest the data sets first, then we started going through the larger repositories down to the smallest. And our goal soon is the plan to switch to the API so we can continuously ingest. So we kind of have a lot of data ingested, but we're not done. And if you want to see some of the data site records in OpenAlex, I will post these links in the chat so you can kind of see, hopefully you have like a JSON viewer or something so you can see this data. Um, but we have 6.4 million records ingested so far from data site. Uh, four, 4 million of those are data sets, 2.4 million are articles. The main repositories we pulled from was Archive, uh, GBIF, Camera Structural Database, Harvard Dataverse, Fixed Shares, and Noto. Um, I think we have about 5 million to 10 million more that we will ingest. We're not planning to ingest the entire data site um, repository because we don't do physical objects or images. And there's quite a few of those from some organizations. So um, we're not going to, we just don't do those yet. If we get the right kind of request for those, we would be happy to. And something cool that we do as well is uh, we have linked the data sets to articles and uh, you can filter. So I'll put a query in here so you can see that like 
these are some works. We have about 600,000 that have, have data sets linked to the article. So that's what we really see a lot of value in is what's cool about data science, being able to link these data sets into their articles and see like what was referenced and have like not just references, but the data sets as well. Okay, some challenges we ran into and that's just some tips for people that put metadata in. Um, some of the titles I heard uh, Patricia mention this is that some of the, the metadata is kind of like a file name structure, which is, you know, abc.pdf or abc.py or something. And then if there's not like something beyond that to say like it links to an article or um, it's referenced by something, you know, that's not much value. So if it at least has a really good title, um, and one I saw this happen with was Harvard Dataverse. It's kind of, it's like the repository name had really good description of what was going, what was in the, what was in there. And I would, I just made my code switch to that and use that as some of the file names and added the file name to the repository name. So at least you could discover more and like search for keywords and find that information. Um, some of the records have like an is identical to relationship that can be tricky. So we had to check for that. And um, I noticed some repositories are handling, handling the fields differently. So that was just some challenges we ran into and like uh, some other, like the do, the de -duplica do duplication process of similar DOIs that are in like say Zenodo, but then there's another one in data, uh, data site that you need to kind of deduplicate those. So that's some challenges we ran into, but overall, I love the format. Actually, I'll go to the next slide. I think I have my things I like. Um, yeah, so what we really love is it's a really clean structure. We're able to link articles to data sets are probably our favorite thing. There's a lot of good funders information. Um, there's broad coverage. And yeah, we're, you can access data site within Open Alex today. Um, Please check out the API documentation. Have you used it, have you used it or the website? I'll also post the documentation in here in case you want to check out the API. And we're excited to finish this project and get more of the rest of data site into Open Alex. That's all I have. Great. Thank you so much, Casey. Um, just turn up the remote control there. Um, yeah, thank you for the really great overview of the Open Alex and the data site. And Justin, I'm really excited to see that um, wrap up. And so with that, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing. Um, we've got um, about 25 minutes for, for Q&A here. And I'm just going to take a look at what's been submitted so far. Um, OK, we've got a couple questions that have been answered for um, for Paolo about the open air graph specifically. Um, so you can look at those in the, the Q&A window. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions for the panelists, please do, do add them to the thing. Um, Casey, I see I see one for you um, from Bridget Cordes. I, I cannot find metadata to data sets in our institutional repository in OpenAlex. What could be the reason our DOIs are registered via data site? might be related to the ingest still being in process, right? Okay, so you're muted. Yeah, it's like that it's the, the full ingest is not done. And I'm just also saying underscore the metadata data sets in our institutional repository. So they, I guess you're saying uh, that you put the institution, that your data set was in your institutional repository and in data site? I think so. Yeah. I, th I think I'll have I mean, to check on that and see what happened, but I think it could be that it's just not done. And especially that we started with some of the larger repositories and moved down and we just, that's going to be, the smaller one's going to be towards the end. And I think they would just have not back to it yet. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Great. Um, also got a couple questions as well, maybe for all of the panelists. Um, so in addition to, um, harvesting from, from data site, um, interested in hearing a bit more about how your services integrate with other sources and other persistent identifier infrastructures. Um, so I don't know if any of you want to 
answer that or, or start off just yeah the connections to other paid infrastructures including like orchid for example roar how that all fits in um so i i can explain how uh, mm, persistent identifiers are useful but of course they can be kind of noisy sometimes so uh, as i was trying to explain in the in the in the uh, chat um so we are collecting from data site and crossfresh for example and the problem there is mainly with the size and the challenge of retyping all the objects understanding what they effectively are because this is the major problem we have so maria mentioned uh, a very nice waterfall but in fact behind the waterfall there's uh, a huge number thousands of sources that are producing water of different kinds, more shallow, more torbid, some are cleaner, some are not. So the side effect is that at the end of the stream, Open Alex, uh, Clarivate, uh, Open Air, all those who are working on this, find information that is may not 100% right. So um, it, it, this is the main challenge. So persistent identifiers are indeed uh, one step forward, but in some cases, this is not obvious. The other problem is when you have different persistent identifiers for the same objects, right? And the organizations are uh, producing this kind of problem. We get persistent identifiers from several sites with several profiles, data sources as well. And of course, as we've seen, uh, the research products. So they are all useful. Combining them for us, and we find ourselves at the end of the stream, is not obvious. And it's never uh, a 100% correct uh, process, right? So that's roughly the challenges that we face in a few words. Um, yeah, for us, I'd say we integrate with a lot, you know, we do heavily integrate with Roar. It's kind of like a first um, class citizen in our, our data set. So what we do is we take the affiliation string, it would be like an author if they said their affiliation with something that gets converted from machine learning to match to a ROAR ID. And then we will match those and take the ROAR as the main piece. And then you can also go from the ROAR ID and kind of get the relationships. You could see uh, the parent organizations from that or the sub organizations from the ROAR ID. And then we are integrated with ORCID as well. Um, I think you just have to take all those different sources and use the best you can. We, we use ORCID to kind of take like uh, authors and assign their works. So we, we've done that recently. So there's like a full ORCID integration now in Open Alex. Um, yeah, I think you're like said that it can be tricky dealing with the different types of IDs that all point that point to the same thing and not ingesting those as separate things. We struggle with that lately and we're trying to get better at it of taking three DOIs that all point to or something yeah. or version Sometimes there's yeah. a DOI that points to a version of something and it's hard to tell if it's a version or a new article, you know, and you just gotta do the best. And then they can. disappear. And sometimes yeah. they disappear and you make yes. something, you know, you base your logic on the fact they will not disappear, but they do. So uh, rebuilding a, a graph after you made such assumptions is not obvious. Um, for example, we have the commission in Europe and European commission does not use more IDs at all. They have, the commission has its own persistent identifiers and has its own definition of what an organization is in terms of granularity. For example, the commission includes companies because they can be part of projects. Uh, all funders that we are collecting uh, projects from have these different ways of understanding uh, organizations as uh, beneficiaries of grants, right? And we get different identifiers from those. They're not all relying on a common understanding or common persistent identifier system. So the duplicating organizations is super hyper complex. So it's not uh, an easy problem. Translation, different ways of staying the same name. It's, it's a major issue. So again, mm -hmm. happy to have persistent identifiers, but <laughs> a kind of, it's a kind of problem. Actually, I actually think that like really helpful at disambiguating just because as you just mentioned, you have all the different formats that are very like tied to the, the education system and, and the culture of a specific country where that repository might be. We encounter this through data science and some other for um places that we have it's from that the author, for example, information, they might just be um in different formats. And by having an orchid, then that kind of like help us pass this um this problem. Also the same with the with the rows. Uh, they might just be 
just the university of something information but then this we've encountered other metadata that they're very descriptive in where the parent institutions coming from so it'll be department of whatever from this particular research group from this particular organization and having the role that really does help it to narrow down where specifically that person is linked to and in the in the web of science we have all the profiles and this information is really helpful at making sure that we are attributing the right journals papers and data to the correct author that is pertaining to the correct institution rather or organization rather than just um trying to guess from all the blurb and excess information that sometimes you do get and definitely not to standardize information great thank you all yeah that's definitely really useful for disambiguation and all of that um just looking at the Q&A, what's open here. Um, this is maybe a hard one for you three to collectively answer, um, but how do these services compare to each other, OpenAir to OpenAlex to the Citation Index? Um, maybe if each of you could speak to kind of, now having seen the other presentations and knowing a bit about the other services as well, like what, what do you see as like what's unique to your service? I guess I might start um, since I was already muted. Um, something that we do take pride on on the data citation index in the web of science is the level of curation that we do um, behind the scenes. So um, I can't speak for all the other platforms out there, but we don't just index everything sometimes, especially if uh, the researchers use uh, Google Scholar. There's a lot of like, false information or false positives that you get, or sometimes you use other services and they just don't have enough. So there's this problem of like too much or too little, whereas we do make sure that what is part of the data citation index is useful for the user. It's got the relevant fields and information that would be helpful to identify, locate and discover the data set, but also at the same time link it to the parent to make the journey of the research a lot easier between one and the other. Um, and like I said, uh, we just try to make sure that what is there um, follows the fair principles and it has the relevant uh, amount of information required. Um, so yeah, I will just <laughs> leave it there. I would say our what makes us kind of different is how easy you can access the data. And I think we are more on breath right now. We have a lot of data. And what we're going towards is kind of like a community curation type structure where we want to be able to have people to go in and update their author profiles to claim works. We have, we answer a lot of support requests every day where people are seeing something it's incorrect and we're helping to improve it. Um, so that's what I say to ours is you can very easily access the API you know, or the website and kind of see what we've done. It's very transparent. You can see uh, the code if you wish. And we try to be very responsive and nimble to make updates. Yeah, that's our probably how we compare. Now, on our side, I think that we have a slightly different focus in the sense that we are trying to address uh, more open science in the general sense related questions. So we're trying to go beyond the general uh, inclusive view of what is a research product. So we, we are not assuming that some research products are not of interest because the focus is not really only on scientific impact. It is also scientific impact. So we're trying to uh, address uh, many of the matters that today in Europe uh, have a reason, for example, on measuring open science trends, the Quara uh, curricula, so the narrative curricula, so viewing, for example, dissemination, communication aspects, uh, ability to engage, uh, which require, of course, to take into account different kinds of products, not just the publications or the peer review publications, but to go a little bit beyond. And of course, to include also the format. So uh, in terms of challenge, we are, um, if I can, uh, then Casey, of course, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a more, let's say, selective process. So you started 
by saying what you really want to have in. So you're com conservative in that way. So because you want to go one step at a time. Well, on the other hand, we try kind of doing the opposite because we're trying to take uh, uh, not everything because everything it would be wrong, but try to take everything that scientists trust as a source in general, and then try to explain what's inside. So it's up to the consumers to decide what they want to use or what they don't want to use in the end. As long as provenance is preserved, as long as uh, quality is tagged in the way metadata is uh, provided, in the way the data sources are including peer review uh, processes and so on. Uh, it's a different perspective, uh, very different. And I think we care a lot about of, of what OpenAlex is doing because uh, it can help uh, uh, many of the challenges that we are, we are today trying to address, for example, uh, the unpayable part. Uh, but we're trying again to uh, go a little bit beyond what is uh, clear and visible, right? And understand what we can do to improve the current scenario because the waterfall that you described, Maria, is extremely uh, useful but it's a little bit uncontrolled at the moment. So uh, I I told you, I gave you a paper, the paper that I wrote on this topic, right? And the kind of issues that we find do not depend on the services that we build. So data site, open Alex and open, and open air or Clarivate, but really depend on the way scientists are used to publish. So the workflows, right? And some of these are not fully controlled or are not aligned or do follow common sense, but not common alignment and practices. So at the, the end of the stream, it's really hard to understand what is effectively valuable for monitoring, for discovery, for use. It's unclear. Define resource data, define resource software, and be able to identify a product as one of these definitions. It's extremely hard today. So I think we're all contributing in different ways to this process. And I hope really uh, the work that we are doing uh, service providers will help to improve the current uh, scholarly communication record because um, it's a challenge. Definitely. Um, yeah, thank you so all so much for, for tackling that that question. Um, we do have one more in the in the Q&A here um, from Mohammed. Um, what advice do you have for other institutions planning to harvest data site metadata based on your experience? Whoever wants to be brave and start off. Um, I can start again. Um, what advice? Um, have good filtering systems in place. <laughs> um, unfortunately, by promoting the uh, minting of DOIs and making data available, you have a lot of noise. And unfortunately, repositories and data size um, you know, you're not immune to it. So there's a lot of stuff disguised as data um, that it's not. So just be prepared for that. And I guess also um, just, just know exactly what you want, I guess. Like you guys provided a dump, but just so you know, there's a lot, a lot of information on that one is a huge, um, data product so just make sure you have the infrastructure to handle it as well uh, but if not within the api you, you are allowed to narrow down your search to exactly what you want and want to harvest so yeah focus just, just make sure that's as detailed as possible to avoid all the noise i think my advice would be <laughs> the data set is really well categorized by type and by repository so I would take that step, like you're kind of saying, Patricia, and you know, understand the data, like get get the full data set, or use the API and just look at like, okay, uh, what if I categorize by data set, like what does this data look like from these different repositories? Because they're handling it slightly different, and then see what you want from the data, and then go ahead and start ingesting. But I I kind of had to set up mine by repository like each repository has its own little chunk of like processing i would say and that's how i'm handling it so i would handle it something similar and in the data set the different type kind of drives your ingest process as well because data sets have different types of relations as compared to articles so you need to handle the relation fields like is supplement to and you got to understand those so 
That's my advice. Really take some time and spend a chunk of time understanding the data. And then before you start ingesting, so I would say. Yeah. Okay. As, as I mentioned, we have uh, kind of the opposite approach. So we're trying to collect what is given and then uh, tag it. So we're going to perform analysis on the data and try to uh, understand the level of completeness or the level of, uh, let's say, carefulness uh, about certain behavior in the publishing process, um, but without making too many assumptions on what is good and what is wrong, because uh, I mean, at least in the open air comes from the uh, repository community. So that's the, 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 the community that we have served mainly uh, in the years. So the libraries, the repository, institutional repositories, data repositories, and um, it's really hard for us to, to judge what it should be in and what should be out. And also because uh, data site, only data site, but we have more, counts like more than 3000 different repositories. And um, in terms of scalability, going one by one and understanding what exactly they do for us is not uh, achievable. At least it's, it's not something that we can do. So the idea is to go the other way around. Basically, we try to uh, explore what they have try to warn, recommend, uh, or highlight uh, potential misbehavior or anomalies and ask them either to take action because some action can only be taken at the repository level. Uh, again, I'm no time to explain here, but really I'd love uh, if you would like to give me feedback on that paper because it somehow resumes all this or at the researcher level because the researchers are in many cases through Figshare, Dryad, Zenodo, B2Share, uh, many catch-all repositories that are playing an important role out there where people upload footprints, researchers follow their own common sense. And this is, unfortunately, even if you put your, your best and your best commitment, we will end up having a theory So what is the resource data for uh, a guy? It could be uh, not for another. And this is, the resource typing is not precise. So it's clean what it comes from uh, data site, but what's behind is unclear, right? So, and in some cases, the mistakes are not made by the researchers. Sometimes they're made by those who are mapping the local resource type to data site vocabulary. So there's a chain of choices there that hides the real uh, action in at the origin. And analyzing this data, I think it's very important, very important to improve the overall life cycle, right? So and then it's, um, it's a non-obvious action to do. Um, I'd like to add that, um, well, the good thing about data side here would also be that it allows the user um, to actually get exactly what they want. So in the case of Opener, you can get everything and then decide what you want to do with that. Or in the case of Open Alex and Clarivate, you just can't tailor your search to exactly what you want. In a case, uh, in response to the question, that is something that if this particular institution wanted to use uh, data side for that purpose, it would be like a great tool. The fact that it allows to whatever your initial step wants to be, it allows you to do that rather than forcing you to take an approach and then just have to carry on that way. Um, yeah. But I would I would imagine the, the way that we do it is close, is more similar to the way the case it does as well. So, but yeah, yeah it's good I, to I see that a, both options are thankfully yeah, available. I think it's a very nice description, yes. And and it's, uh, and I think we need at some point to sit down and uh, at least identify common issues that we can, like recommendations on principles, because we cannot keep doing this job without interacting with the original producers of this content, right? And and suggest what are the problems or identify the problems. So our tools should not just be uh, there to serve a specific application scenario, but should also be there to improve the overall possibility to provide such application scenarios with good data. That's the feeling I have. So I think what DataSite is doing uh, is excellent because they have this super channel through the world and us, right? But we are in the condition because we are collecting also other sources, et cetera, to somehow summarize all these efforts and feedback the communities, the original communities with recommendations, suggestions, hints on how this can be improved because we know what the challenges are, right? And uh, the application scenarios are actually <laughs> a killer applications for us, for our services. 
Hey, thank you all so much. Um, we've got a couple more questions in the chat. Um, I think are really interesting here. We've got a few more minutes. Um, so first from Ali, um, how important is having adequate subject metadata to the harvesters as opposed to other fields like contributors, repository, et cetera? I ask because we have been upping our metadata game in DOI creation, but we've identified our subject headings as an area of weakness. I'll speak um, to that from- Yeah, sorry. Okay. No, go ahead, Casey, because I've been starting every time, so I'll happily okay. take a second. Oh, sorry. I would just say for us, we don't use the subjects in Datasite um, because we have our own model that kind of like takes the title, the abstract, or and the source of where we- or It takes the title, abstract, um, if we know the source of where it's at and things it references, all that together builds topics for us. So we don't use the subjects because it, then we would have like different types of subjects involved and that kind of gives us a uniform topics type model across all of our data. So that's, that's us. Um, at the data citation index, we actually have our own subject classification um, that it's heavily dependent on the repository. However, the subject information that we get through the metadata harvest from data side, we actually use it as, as a keyword, I guess you could say. And it's I, I would say it's highly beneficial for the for the researcher just because you can use that on the data citation index for to make a search. So you can use this keyword subject information and they will retrieve all the data sets that have that level of information. So in in my view, in our view, it will be beneficial for the discoverability of the data set. We have a wide variety of repositories. You might not know exactly which one will target your needs. You might not know the authors or the titles that might target your needs, but you have a keyword. And that's a starting point for the researcher sometimes. And I find that all these additional information, the richer the metadata is, the more it helps the user to retrieve the, uh, the data set in this case. So I would say, yes, carry on improving the metadata. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's uh, incredibly important for many application scenarios, not just discovery. Uh, for example, identifying trends for funders is very important. And you can only do it if you explore certain scenarios uh, from the point of view of the topic that has been touched. For example, if you combine funds with products that are being funded by such funds and trends, you may also identify new trends, new innovation strategies, and invest in one rather than another. Uh, you can measure the impact of those, for example, scientific impact to identify what's most precious for researchers recently. So the combination of topics is, uh, we do a, AI for this to detect SDGs and FOS. It's an extremely hard cha and challenging task because it's expensive in terms of resources, very expensive, and it requires uh, the PDFs. So the full text of the publications to do this properly because abstracts sometimes are not enough, but yes, I would love to have this information at the original uh, metadata site. Um, this is not the case. Uh, this is not the case. And, and in fact, SDGs are provided in some cases, but they come in different shapes and formats. So that implies again, another crosswalk effort that is crazy to maintain and to sustain if you're going uh, towards thousands of sources. So uh, it's yet another challenge, uh, but yes, definitely extremely important. Well, well, thank you all so much for um, for joining today and for answering these questions and for presenting on your systems. Um, and thank you to participants for um, asking various questions to them. Um, I just have a couple of things to close with here. I'm gonna share my screen once more. Um, yeah, so um, we do have a couple more sessions coming up today. Um, Actually, in um, two and a half hours from now is, is the next one. Um, and so if you aren't already registered, you can still do so on the Datasite website, um, datasite.org slash events, and then you can find them there. Um, and we have also got some links coming to you in the chat 
Um, in particular, one I want to highlight is we have a metadata schema request for comments that just launched yesterday. Um, and so if you are interested in reviewing those proposed changes and giving us feedback, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, I think that is everything for today. We're right on time. So I just want to thank everyone again for your participation. Um, and then I'll close off and give you a couple of minutes back of your day. Thank you all. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.